in carrying out the general principle that all things are to be done decently in order, last verse, 1 Corinthians 14, there must be the proper answer to the following question which sets out what we're going to study this afternoon. That question is, can God and your brethren depend on you? Can God and your brethren depend on you? Of course, the first part of this is, can God depend on you? But then there ought to be a question you're raising in your mind at this point when I say, can God depend on you? And that question ought to be, to do what? Can God depend on you? And you should be saying, well, to do what? Well, I'm going to simply answer it with one verse of a very common passage to all of us that we use most often. Probably doesn't get practiced anywhere nearly like it ought to, but we know it. It's in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So can God depend upon you and you say to do what? To seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. But when you answer that in a general way, following that question, there are other questions that arise regarding our obligations as brothers and sisters in Christ to one another and even to those out in the world that need to hear the gospel of Christ, that need to see the leavening influence of good that comes from godly people living daily among them. Now, I said this is basically caught up in the idea of everything being done decently in order. Of course, that implies the standard of authority that we all appeal to to know what God would have us do. So we understand that part of it. But don't try to think about what somebody else ought to be doing, even though they ought to be doing it maybe. But try to say, uh, can your brother depend on you? Who? Well, when you understand what the Bible teaches about, let's say, in the organization of the church, the elders, the shepherds, the bishops, can they depend on you? Elders have an obligation to the church to shepherd the church and the minute details that the Bible talks about that. Their primary work is in the area of uh, what is the best option to choose to discharge the obligation God lays on the church. They have to know the church, what the church is capable of doing. That's going to cause them to figure out what options are best chosen to carry out or discharge the obligation. There always must be the idea of advantage in the option that is chosen to discharge any given obligation that God and his authoritative words place upon the church. So what do we owe the elders when they're striving to watch after our souls, make sure the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of the gospel is taught, that they seek to defend the faith, can they expect help from the different members? Well, in the organization of the church on the local level, which is the only way it is organized, there are also deacons. Deacons are, the office of deacons, are assigned certain tasks to do. I like to think of them as the uh, lieutenants to the elders. They, too, must meet certain qualifications that prove that they are active. If you'll notice one of those, they're already doing the work of a deacon is one reason that they are to be considered, and then when they meet the other qualifications, appointed to that office. They don't do the same work as the elders do. They're not shepherds of the flock as the elders are. But in all of this, each one, his brothers and sisters in Christ, has an obligation to care for their brethren and to help each other come to the proper knowledge of the truth and to see that we're living as we ought to live. What about Bible classes? Well, teachers. Well, those teachers can't teach what they don't know. And the elders have an obligation to make sure teachers are in classes that know what they're teaching. 
You can go on and on. Spouses, parents, all this is involved. Can your brethren depend on you? Can your wife depend on you? Can your husband depend on you? Can your children depend on you? When I say depend, I mean to be what the Bible says you ought to be. Can our young people in general depend on you? Young people have needs. Older folks have needs. People rearing children have needs. Do we think about them? Are we that mindful of them and those particular needs? There's an interesting one I'll throw in here, and this is, can I depend on myself? Because no matter how much help you get, no matter how much encouragement you get from other people, no matter elders, deacons, preachers, whatever, no matter how much good teaching you get from the best Bible teachers, unless you're going to put it into practice yourself, it's wasted. You're a free moral agent. You can know the truth and reject evil and embrace the truth, or you can do it right the other way around too. So I have to ask as I go into this business, can God and your brethren depend on you and seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you? Can I depend on myself to put into practice the truths of God concerning who I am? Man, woman, spouse, children, even as an employee or an employer, God addresses how we are to conduct ourselves in those positions. Can God depend upon me to be simply a Christian and all that the New Testament defines that to be? Can our older people then depend upon us? We know that our Lord was asked, who is my neighbor? And we usually think of neighbors as those living right close around us. But in the way the Bible talks about it, it's anybody in need. So can our neighbors, can those in need depend upon us to be mindful of those things? The Bible says we should be. And every one of these I've mentioned, the Bible says we in living the Christian life are to be mindful of these. Our co-workers, our classmates, we are to set a godly example, pattern of life before one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, then in the families, husbands, wives, parents, children, in the schools, students, at workplace, employer, employee. There's no place that you're not to be a Christian. And the Bible tells you how to do these things. Now you'll notice each one of them could and does demand a lesson in itself as to the details. What are my particulars, say, for instance, uh, my obligations that the Bible lays on me as an employee or an employer? We can study all of that. We study the home at times as the responsibilities of husband and wife, one toward the other, and so on. So I realize there's a certain amount of specificity here, but really it's pretty general, but it's enough to make us think if we will think. When we promise to do something, promise to do something, do we make sure we do it? Now, I recognize as a human being you can't control everything. You can have the best intentions of the world to do what's right and plan on doing it. Things can come to hinder you, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when we make a promise, we fully intend to fulfill that promise. Can our brethren, our young people, older people, neighbors, co-workers, whoever it is, classmates, can they trust us? Am I trustworthy to do what the Lord authorizes us to do? Again, in every one of these areas, we're to do what's authorized by the New Testament. I don't know what Jesus wants me to do if I don't know my Bible. And remember, the church is a kingdom. It's not a democracy. It's not a republic. Jesus is an absolute monarch, and his word is law. Thus, as I said this morning, he that, Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So what it says now and means now, it will say and mean 
on the judgment day, whether it's tomorrow or a thousand years from now. That's an absolute objective standard of conduct when it comes to becoming a Christian and living a Christian life. I want you to consider Romans 1 31 where it talks about the Gentiles who desired not to retain God in their knowledge and they left him. He talks about people, one of the signs of their apostasy, they were covenant breakers. That's contract breakers. You couldn't take them at their word. Then he mentions uh, the idea of being untrustworthy. I'm, I'm thinking about throughout the whole New Testament the importance of trustworthiness and how people are untrustworthy. Well, a covenant breaker is untrustworthy. And if you look at verse 32 of Romans 1, it says that they are worthy of death. If you don't keep your word, if you make promises, and you don't keep them, you're worthy of death. I didn't say that. Open your Bible up and read what God says to you about that. So the opposite of untrustworthy is dependability. So Christians are to be people you can trust. But you must also be a person who trusts himself or herself. If we win the battle in our own minds of what is right and wrong as the Bible teaches us, as it's rightly divided and we study it, 2 Timothy 2.15, we've got the battle mostly won. So we need to strive to be dependable and trustworthy to those with whom we live our lives. It just, a lot of it comes down to honesty. Luke 8, 15 talks about the seed of the kingdom being sown in honest and good hearts, and those hearts are the one that bring forth right fruit. Do I work to keep myself honest that when I say something, I will stand by it? That also goes along with being corrected when you're wrong. Can you stand correction? Can I stand correction? Well, I don't know how I would have ever become a Christian if I hadn't been willing to be corrected. Do you know how you would have become a Christian without being corrected? Because I had to come to grips with the fact that I'm wrong. I stand before God condemned because I'm a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. I had to come to grips with that. A lot of people will not do that. They know they're not doing what the Bible says. Some don't even know that. They're in ignorance of what the Bible says. Well, are they willing to be instructed? Are they willing to be honest with what the Bible says, maybe in preconceived views they have? Are they willing to change as they see the need to change, to fit the truth they learn? Now, once you become a Christian, it doesn't mean you know everything. The Bible speaks of those newly baptized into Christ as babes in Christ. We're taught to desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. We want to reach a stage to where we're not just always fed on milk, as it were, but we're able to uh, chew on meat, if you please, to show growth and development in the food that we take in, spiritually speaking. So I need to know what I'm able to handle. I don't think sometimes people think about that enough. They jump out and try to tackle things they're not able to handle. Sometimes they do that. Well, if you're honest with yourself and doing your best to study the Bible, you know whether you're ready to tackle some things, to deal with some things, or you need to go get somebody else to help you. That's part of learning to depend on others and depend on yourself and the reason honesty is so important. Fellowship with one another, and the root word koinonia is, is, is sharing between one another that which is peculiar to our being brothers and sisters in Christ as the Bible teaches that. It, it means that Christians can depend on one another. I don't know whether we think about that when it comes to fellowship. Depend on one another. Maybe we think of it as, well, I can depend on the ladies to cook a good meal at our fellowship meal. Well, that's fine to be able to depend that way, but that doesn't cover 
the whole thing. It means on the whole work of the church and the worship of the church. John wrote, or Jesus actually said, and John, by inspiration, recorded it, the Apostle John 13, chapter 13 of John, verses 34 and 35. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Then he says something that's so important and ties directly into this. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. Now that's not some sort, as I said last week in the sermon, syrupy, ooey, gooey, uh, better felt than told, subjective, emotional romanticism. It's not that. The love that's being spoken of here does mean tender affection and that we certainly have that feeling one toward another as brothers and sisters in the family of God. But it means also a Paul withstanding a Peter to the face because Peter had done wrong. Paul wrote the great love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. He knew as an apostle what was right. He knew what was wrong. And he knew Peter played the hypocrite in Antioch. And he was stood into the face, as he says, because he was to be blamed. Well, I believe that uh, Paul loved Peter like he should. And I think you can recognize this from Peter that he realized that he needed that. Well, we've, we've grown a lot when we realize that uh, we needed that correction. We needed that kind of rebuke. Remember that preachers are taught to be faithful in life and living the truth, but as they preach the word, they reprove, rebuke, and exhort with long, long suffering and doctrine. Now, I want you to notice there's no way you can preach the gospel and not do one of those three or a combination of them. Just say, Well, I'm going to preach the word of God, but I'm not going to rebuke, <laughs> I'm not going to reprove. And I'm not going to exhort. Well, then what are you doing? The Word of God does one of those or a combination of them every time it's read or studied. When you read your Bible at home, you're preaching to yourself. You know that, don't you? You're studying to know the mind of Christ to apply it to your life. Can you depend on yourself to make the proper application of the truth to your life? Or are you like the king of old who when he came across something didn't suit him, he and knifed it right out and threw it in the fireplace. Well, you don't have to literally do that, but you can do it mentally. Can I depend on myself to receive with meekness the engrafted or implanted word which is able to save my soul, especially when that rubs me the wrong way? By that I mean I'm doing something or not doing something that the Bible says I need to do or not do. And am I willing to change? Nobody becomes a Christian unless they're willing to change. I've said it many times. I'll continue to say it as long as I have the opportunity to and can, that our will is our greatest enemy. I like things done the way I like them done. Now, if you don't, say that I like things done the way you like them done, I want to stand quite a ways away from you because I know better than that. I'm not talking about when it comes to obeying the gospel, but I'm talking about in every other way. God gives us liberty in a lot of things to like things done a certain way. I like this food. I don't like this food. Now, I love turnip greens. Ken doesn't love turnip greens. So he's wrong. <laughs> there are a lot of things that where we have the liberty to like or dislike. I like boiled okra. Or if I'm proper, I'll say okra. But I grew up saying okra. Anybody here like boiled okra? I see. Now there, see Ken, there's a little Ken here. You just need to learn to like turnip greens. We'll make it all right. <laughs> We have that right to lie. I, I'm using food because it's so easy to do it. Uh, but think about so many things. A lot of folks like baseball, football. Some like football more than baseball. And on and on you go, basketball. 
So God's given us the liberty in a lot of things to be free to do those things. But at the same time, we are to not isolate one another because we don't like certain things. There's a difference in likes and sin. Difference in likes and sin. So if we're to love one another, we want people to do only what God says. We can't change that. We can't compromise. Thus teaching the word, the word rebukes. It exhorts. It reproves. When I read it, it does the same thing for me. To myself. We need to know the implications of our being members of one another. What does it mean to be members of one another? Paul said we are in Romans 12, 5. That we're like a body. Now, you may not be thinking very much about your elbow right now, but I promise you, if you bang into one of these benches in the wrong way when you get up, your whole body will think of your elbow. And so it is with members of the church. We're to be devoted to one another in brotherly love, Romans 12, 10, to recognize that, that there's something different about the members of the church. They're not like the people of the world. They've heard the gospel. They've believed it and from the heart obeyed it. It's like I have. And we ought to be special to one another. We ought to give preference to one another in honor. So Paul said in Romans 12, verse 10, and be of the same mind one to another, Romans 12, 16. Now, that's not that easy to do, getting into who you like and why you like them and things about people you like and don't like. You may find yourself being guilty of being a respecter of persons if you don't watch out. But we do our best to be objective in dealing with one another, not practice favoritism. And thus we strive to build each other up in knowledge of the truth and the practice of the truth, Romans 14 and verse 19. And to accept one another, Romans 15, 7. I've spoken this morning on racism and I've been dealing with it some in our class on ethics on Sunday morning. But you know, there are people I like more than other people. There may be cultural differences between people's ethnic groups. I may not care much about certain of those cultural things that are peculiar to somebody else. But that doesn't mean it's sin. I may choose to be with those who are more alike in my social involvement in cultural things. But that doesn't mean I treat other people a bad way. You know what would solve the whole problem with people problems? Whatsoever you would that men should do unto you, do ye even also unto them. That would destroy all the problems of people relations. Just treating others like I would want to be treated. And yet we are to admonish one another, Romans 15 and verse 14. I think we find that sometimes a problem when we have to actually go up to a brother and say, you need to reconsider what you're saying. You know, when I was a kid and grew up, I used a lot of uh, slang words. They weren't curse words, but they were slang words. Everybody used them. Nobody thought anything about it. But when I started trying to live right, I got associated with the older preacher, older than my parents. And he didn't put up with that. And he would say, don't say that. Well, I didn't know I was saying anything I shouldn't. And he explained it to me. Well, it didn't take me very long to root all that out of my vocabulary. Some people just don't know. So admonishing means teaching and showing. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. It all goes along with it, and you can't teach the Word of God without doing it. How about serving one another? Do we do that? I don't mean pass the beans again. They're good. 
I mean, actually willing to go into one another and help where they can't get things done. I think from what I've seen in the congregation here and the most people I've been with, when they realized that there was a problem, they would jump right in there and try to alleviate the problem. That's part of what's involved in discharging our duty in Galatians 6, 2, to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. I know we all can be kind to one another and tenderhearted, forgiving. You can't forgive people who won't repent of their sins, but you can be ready to forgive them and help them come to the knowledge of the truth that they can repent of their sins, Ephesians 4:32. You speak to, you teach, you admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, Ephesians 5 and verse 19. We're to be subject one to another. My likes and dislikes should not be pressed upon you, and you shouldn't be pressing your likes and dislikes upon me, even though there's nothing necessarily sinful in those likes. So in all way, have you noticed every one of these so far says, I'm considerate of the other person? And their likes and dislikes. And bearing with one another, forgiving one another, Colossians 3 and verse 13. And certainly not lying to one another, Colossians 3, 9. Now, it pains me to say this, but over the years, I know there's been members of the church that have lied to me. And I've seen them do it when elders have gone to visit with them and they just simply come up with the most fantastic reasons for why they don't attend the services, why they do what they do, and they're not reasons, they're just excuses. The elders and I in one place went to visit this couple. These were not new Christians, they were older people. At that time they were older than my parents and they had been missing services. And we went to visit them and just talk directly with them and they came up with some sort of excuse. I don't remember the specific excuse, but I decided before I went in there, whatever was said, I would meet it with this. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And every excuse the man made, I just quoted that verse back to him and just looked at him. He knew it was scripture, he knew it, he understood it, he knew the meaning of it, he knew the order of it, and he knew that everything he said wouldn't allow it to, whatever he said to stand. So we're to teach and admonish one another. How can we say we love each other when we let each other live in sin? We encourage one another, we build up one another, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 11. Can God depend on you? to do that with your brethren? Can you depend on yourself to keep yourself straight? Can you depend on yourself to practice these things with your brethren? We're taught to live at peace with one another and to esteem, esteem, esteem them very highly for, their, for love's sake or in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves, 1 Thessalonians 5.13. I've seen situations and said in things that you wonder, are these really Christians? Do they, do they understand? Because they're fighting like kids in a sandbox who want something. We're to seek after that which is good. I don't know what's good without God telling me what's good. Genuinely, what is good? See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. First Thessalonians 5.15 we're to provoke or stimulate one another to love and good deeds, good works, Hebrews 10, 24. And you see the overlapping of these because we're to encourage one another in spiritual things, Hebrews 10, 25. And that encouragement is taking place even in an assembly like this. I like to think of those assemblies that we're not to forsake, wherein we worship God, as assemblies of exhortation. Because what's going on right now is designed to exhort the church to be dependable. When we sing various songs, we're teaching and admonishing one another. When we pray, we're praying for one another, and so on. And of course, when we observe the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, we're showing forth the Lord's death till he come again and reminding ourselves of what it costs to save us from our sins. That's why that these assemblies 
are assemblies of exhortation. And when you choose not to be in those assemblies of exhortation, you're missing out on what God wants you to have to strengthen you to serve God, and you're showing Him other things matter more than that. We're to refrain from speaking against one another concerning things that are evil. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art a doer of the law. Not a doer of the law, but a judge, James 4.11. That's written to Christians. The idea is not that we don't deal with the sins in our brethren's lives. That's obvious from Paul dealing with Peter. So James can't be talking about dealing with sins in our brethren's lives, but there's a way to do it. It's talking about we can come up with all sorts of things. Well, I just know so-and-so did that because of this. No, you don't know any such thing. You think that. But unless you have proof, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, First Thessalonians 5.21, then you don't need to be saying that. You don't know the motives of other people unless some way it's revealed to you. Take Ananias and Sapphira. They're wicked people. We wouldn't know that they did what they did if inspiration didn't step in and told us. Just simply go back and look at Ananias and Sapphira without aid of God telling us what was going on in their hearts and what they discussed. They might have been some of the most prominent, at least appeared to be prominent, active members of the church in Jerusalem. But they weren't, were they? But we're not in a position to know those things at times. And then we have, we close out on this, that we're to confess our sins one to another. We're to pray one for another. James 5, 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Anybody here think that they have got it made? There's no improvement you need to make in your life? Well, you probably won't then. If that's the case, you're going to be sliding backwards. But if we really love one another from the heart, 1 Peter 1, then we're going to be mindful of our brethren and what they know and what they're doing and how they're living. We're going to know the difference in sins and likes and dislikes and cultural differences and we're going to be able to do unto others we would have them do unto us. And we close out with 1 Peter 4, 9, that we are to be hospitable to one another. Now you realize each one of these points that I made, that I said it in the beginning, each one of these points is worthy of a whole sermon and maybe more than one. But it shows you what is involved in being a Christian everywhere and in every place under all situations and circumstances that God's Word governs us. When people tell me, and I've thought this since I was a, well, since I was a teenager, why well, there's no challenge to living the Christian life, I'll give you a copy of this outline if you want it. And you tell me there's not a challenge to do that all day long every day in your life. Why, it's easy to be an elder. It's easy to be a deacon. It's easy, easy. What do you mean by easy? Paul said after preaching the truth to others that he buffeted his body and brought it in subjection. Lest after having preached to others, he was a castaway. Now, it may be easy to understand the message, but bringing one's mind and body in subjection to the truth of God under every situation circumstance is not sometimes that easy. It takes all you've got to do it. It takes putting your all into it, wholly given to God's Word. It's not a thing you easily just move around and do as if there's not much to it. Now, that's the way people do a lot of things. And if you look at the religions around us and the way people are treating religion today, it just kind of, let's go have a big time. And you see all of this entertainment and all this kind of stuff. And the biggest shows that you can put on means you're the greatest Christians and all that kind of thing. You don't find that in your New Testament. You just can't find it. You find being a Christian a serious and sobering matter. 
And you find us being warned that your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, goeth about seeking whom he may devour. And he does it 24 hours a day. Now that says we've got to be on our P's and Q's. We've got to be sober-minded. Do you ever think of how many times the Bible tells us to be sober-minded, see things as they really are, and then deal with them as they are? Not live in some fantasy land, but to live where we are. The Bible is designed to help us face the facts of life. Those facts sometimes aren't too pretty. I close with this. Jesus Christ knew before he ever became a human being where his life was going to end up and how it was going to end. And he would make a statement like this concerning his death on the cross. To this end was I born. Because he knew what it would take to save us from our sins. We should follow in his steps. We are members of the spiritual body of Christ. He's the head. We carry on where he left off to the best of our ability in keeping God alive before the world and alive in our actions as we put into practice things like we've talked about this afternoon as Christians. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, we urge you to become one. As the Bible defines that, to believe with all your heart that Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. To live your life, a faithful life, a holy life in the church, teaching the truth and contending for it. And if you do sin, knowing the second law of pardon is repentance, confession of sin, and praying God for forgiveness. If you're subject then to the invitation of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.